And uh, so the topic uh, is uh, how to open the RVOT in these cases of pulmonary atresia and intact ventricular septum. And I thank uh, Dr. Schreiber that he also opted for the RVOT opening and showed all the uh, um, advantages you have with that. And uh, I will tell you that we can achieve this also in a different way because the, uh, the arguments for that are most of all the same. So um, it came up uh, in the early 90s that uh, two doctors, uh, the one was in London and uh, the other one was in uh, the US, um, had the idea to open up uh, this uh, pulmonary atresia interventionally. And uh, at that time, over these uh, several decades before, the mortality of the surgical procedure was fairly high. And at that time, it was around 20 to 40 percent. So it was uh, Jacques Qureshi and Larry Latson who first uh, did these uh, perforations interventionally, the one with the laser-assisted system and uh, the other one uh, with the system we know today, we mostly use today, the transcathedral puncture with the radiofrequency wire. So the treatment goal, as uh, you already heard, is of course to avoid cardiac surgery. That's the thing we would like to achieve with the interventional approach, maybe all together, or at least in the vulnerable neonatal early period. And of course, to achieve an excellent biventricular long-term outcome without any kind of surgical, maybe also intervention or re-intervention. So the way to do, you, you mostly know, is uh, we use this uh, radio frequency generator. We have uh, this uh, radio frequency wire, which we position below the valve perforate it and balloon it. That's the way it looks. That's an angiogram from lateral view. Uh, we see this right ventricle. We see the atresia. And uh, we see the perforated valve after the intervention. First, we put the catheter below the valve, one catheter above. So we have to get a vascular excess from the groin and uh, from the artery and the venous side. And then we puncture it with the radio frequency wire. and. Uh, then we balloon it, we position a wire through the um, hole, and we position the wire um, to, into the PDA if possible. Then we first use a coronary balloon, and finally we go for a balloon analyst ratio of uh, 1.2 to dilate it to an adequate uh, size. So that's the way it looks like afterwards. So success rate of this intervention is high. It's above 85% to open up this uh, uh, membrane. Um, after all, you have an antigrad pulmonary flow and an oxygen saturation above 80 percent. That's an, we would uh, opt as a success. And uh, most of the patients, uh, you can stop prostaglandin immediately after perforation in the lab. Um, <clears throat> so I could stop here. I could say success, great thing. Uh, but you would say no, that's only half of the truth, and uh, you already heard uh, some things about that. So I have to come back again to the, the time before we start the intervention. So we have to build, put our, ourselves some questions. Which patient is suitable for an interventional approach? Which patient will profit from that opening of the tragic pulmonary artery? And the other question we also have, how can we make the congenital surgeon's life more stress-free and relaxing? by taking over some of their hard work. So we, we heard about this heterogeneity of the morphology of this uh, right ventricle and of the pulmonary arteries. And we have the group A, the good RV anatomy. We have these intermediate cases. And we have the severe RV hypoplasia. And uh, there are some uh, things. There's the tripartite RV and the good where we, where we call it a good anatomy. We have a membranous atresia, and we don't see any fistular sinusoids. And the borderlines, they already have some fistulas. They can have already big, bigger connections between the coronaries and the right ventricle. And it's more pronounced, of course, in this group C. So that would be a case, uh, tripartite RV, no coronary fistula. So maybe to say no RV-dependent coronary circulation, that's very important, and we do not have any severely dysplastic tricuspid valve or abstinence anomaly, so in this patient, we would opt for 
perforation. And there's the other end of the spectrum, unipartite RV, coronary fistulas, maybe uh, in this case they are RV dependent uh, coronary circulation. I do not know about this tricuspid uh, valve, but uh, it, should, it is uh, mostly expected to be uh, dysplastic in this case. So here we definitely would not go for the interventional opening. So, and these are these uh, borderline cases. Um, what to do here? Also a right ventricle with uh, at least two parts, uh, inflow and outflow. We see the infundibulum, and we see also some uh, kind of coronary connection. In this case, uh, it was decided to open and uh, looks nice afterwards and uh, with a good undergrad flow, and the success mainly uh, was related to the fact that this coronary circulation was not RV dependent. So it's important to know that and to get the best information about this before you start your intervention. So again, coming back to these three groups, we have the option to do that in group A for sure, and in the intermediate group also if we have a favorable anatomy. The results after the opening are promising. The, uh, the pressure comes down immediately after the intervention from uh, suprasystemic pressures to uh, lower ones, and uh, the tricuspid regurge also immediately uh, gets better after having opened and decompressed the RV. But there are things which we have to discuss and we have to be aware of. There is still a certain mortality also in this uh, approach. It's uh, reported between 0 and 21 percent, uh, mostly due to the perforation of the RV or the pulmonary artery uh, during this uh, radio fre frequency perforation. Um, and there have been reported some arrhythmia, necrotizing, enterocolitis, of course due to the PDA and uh, its uh, pulmonary flow from there, and thrombosis of the vessels uh, where you entered. So we have to be aware of uh, these adverse events and uh, do everything to, to get rid of them and uh, to avoid them. This uh, group that was in the early experiences, they, they made a comparison between the, their results with the perforation, radio frequency perforation, perforation and surgical results. They even saw a better outcome concerning morbidity and mortality. That's not always the same, but that depends very much on the institutions. Here we see they have a less, uh, lesser ventilation uh, uh, time, lesser time on, uh, on the ICU, and uh, even mortality was lower in the radio fre frequency uh, group. So um, we heard about already about these uh, things about re-interventions, and this is also a question sh you have to ask yourself before, is it very uh, uh, can you expect uh, the, this, this case to be re-intervented early, either surgically or interventionally? And uh, one could say in this group A, with a favorable anatomy, um, re-interventions are quite uncommon. And in this uh, borderline group, there exists one, some who have the very good uh, RV uh, growth afterwards. They do not need any further interventions and the other ones need surgical or interventional re-interventions. And uh, these is uh, numbers from uh, Philadelphia. They have looked at their patients, so there is a certain number, uh, significant number of patients who will need any kind of re-intervention during the uh, following course. But if you look at it in the very first days and weeks, um, it's not that much, it's even above 75% uh, of patients who did not need, but of course, later on, there are some re-interventions which have to be done. You see that here. Um, of course, uh, one can do RVOT dilation. It can be done surgically or interventionally. Some patients did need a shunt afterwards. Some needed a stenting of the duct. Others uh, needed a glen uh, in the, in the uh, course. Others uh, could be treated completely interventionally by closing the ASD, closing the PDA in the following course. So there is a large vari variability of surgical re-interventions and also the re-intervention rate. And I would say that this is likely linked, of course, to the anatomic differences among the treated patients, but 
I would say also that it's very, uh, depends very much on the different attitudes regarding the maximal accepted duration of prostaglandin uh, infusion after having perforated the pulmonary artery. If you look at these results from, uh, <coughs> from Philadelphia, where they compared their patients with surgery after perforations and those without surgery, you see, of course, those who did not have a surgery, they stopped prostaglandin quite early, within the first week, mostly. And the other ones who needed surgery, they received surgery quite early, also mostly within the first two weeks. Was there a need for that? I would say there were some patients, or maybe more than some, who could have gone for a further interventional way or for just waiting until this right ventricle might grow and will take over the hemodynamic, uh, the, the pulmonary flow. So I would, I would say it, it, there's a need to wait for at least three to four weeks before you stop completely your prostaglandin and then you can say whether it works or not, whether you need uh, an additional shunt or an additional PDA stent. And uh, from our own institutional um, approach, we have made the experience that with that way, we only have a surgical re-intervention rate of around 20% and not that high as it has been reported before. Um, so they, this, these are also the results uh, from the Philadelphia group and they, they looked at uh, the risk factors which uh, influenced um, the requirement of a supplemental blood flow after radiofrequency perforation and what they saw um, that's, of course, again, the tricuspid valve, which makes it predictable whether you need it afterwards or not, and the weight of the patient. And again, results from another group, also again, tricuspid valve makes it a bit predictable whether these patients might need a surgical reintervention after perforation or not. And again, after perforation, what do you have to achieve? You have to achieve a gradient which is as low as much. And uh, they could show here that in the low, here you can see that the gradient after perforation, which was below or around 10, was more likely to have no surgery afterwards than the one with a higher gradient of around 19, which needed surgery uh, during the following timeline. So, and the other thing they also could show that there exists a certain learning curve. They showed their results from their, from their own time intervals from 2002 to 2005 and uh, the later time, and they saw there was a lower need of surgical RBOT augmentation after perforation and uh, the supplemental blood, pulmonary blood flow. You could also choose a PDA stenting during your first opening of the valve or maybe later after. These are results from London where they compared their results uh, having stented the PDA during the first intervention. So the complete intervention was intervention, uh, catheter intervention. And what they could show in the cases where they put in the stent from the very beginning, that the ICU stay was shorter, the days in hospital were shorter, and in these patients, they did not even have any kind of re-intervention during the following course. And most of these ducts closed completely during just waiting and stopping aspirin later on when it's no longer needed. And of course, this, the numbers are higher here in the stented and not stented group, but you have to be careful. Stenting the duct means you could cause a pulmonary overflow and uh, something which they call the figure of eight circulation if you have the uh, problem of a tricuspid regurge and a pulmonary regurge together and an open PDA, that can cause a major problem and the whole hemodynamic might fail and uh, that's something you should completely avoid and be aware of that. And another thing you could also adopt for is a hybrid approach for this. So it's a combination of um, interventional approach and uh, surgical approach and this uh, Case. It's a case of our own institution that was a preterm uh, child with a birth weight of two, 1,270 grams with a membranous pulmonary atresia. 
And here we decided for a hybrid approach because it's uh, difficulty to get uh, the vascular access and to, to enter this smallish right ventricle. So we, we used the perventricular access, the chest was open, and the patient was uh, laid on the table in a hyperextended way, so the apex of the right ventricle came out a bit. One could puncture the right ventricle, put in a four French, and by this uh, perforating it with a radio frequency wire, looking like this, and uh, the loon, the valve thereafter, and there was a final result with an undergrad pulmonary flow and, of course, uh, moderate pulmonary regurg. So hybrid approach is also something you could choose, and it's technically feasible, it's highly successful, and uh, these results, as shown in this publication, are comparable to those treated with uh, surgical or transcatheter approaches. So what you achieve with this, you avoid cardiopulmonary bypass in these patients, you might even mitigate the technical failure rate of the percutaneous approach, and you definitely have a lower complication rate. You do not, mostly do not have any risk of RVOT perforation. If you look at the longer follow-up, that's something you, we would like to, to see, a biventricular circulation, a well-developed right ventricle um, after having perforated the valve. And uh, this can be achieved in more than 85% of these patients having been treated interventionally from the very beginning. And this is a nice publication showing the development of uh, the parameters you had diminished in the beginning. There are others I'm sure about, but uh, you see here the RV parameters normalizing within uh, the following months. You have a slightly limited growth of the pulmonary valve and the tricuspid as well. And in some patients, even you see a slight dilatation of their RV during the follow-up. So if you are not yet convinced, maybe I can help you to show you some other allergen solutions from real life, which you also use already, which also show you the minimal evasiveness. There's minimal evasiveness is sometimes even better than to be too invasive. I hope. Many people did not experience that, and uh, there are different uh, ways to solve it. You can go directly, and it's quite uncomfortable, you can uh, see, and there could be also another way. You can choose this frequency perforation wire to get rid of the problem, and so that's, I would say, well accepted. And another thing I could show you is a, this thing of, a, I would say it's Alps atresia. Swiss people, they have the problem, they want to get over from the north to the south or from the south to the north, and uh, they, they have to build ways through the mountains, and uh, they have to cross them. They can walk over, that takes quite a long time, or they want to build new ways. They can do it that way. They can dig and make a way through there, they can cut the mountains, but I'm sure that no Swiss people, any Swiss people would, would choose that way to go through. They would always choose that way to build a tunnel, that's a Gotthard base tunnel, maybe some of you have heard of that, will be the greatest, the, greatest, uh, the longest train tunnel in the world, will be finished next year, will be around 50, 70 kilometers afterwards. And, uh, what they use for that are perforation tools, as you see here, a bit comparable to the thing I told you before. Uh, so one could also say, don't, don't bite the mountain, but stent it. <laughs> okay, so coming back a bit more serious to the conclusion, so this technique of pulmonary valvotomy has evolved to, from a pioneering intervention to a mainstay of treatment, I would say for these patients, it's extremely important that we have a very good morphologic preselection. We cannot treat every patient that way. We need to have a tripartite RV, sometimes a bipartite RV also works for that. We should not have any RV dependent coronary circulation. The tricuspid valve should not be dysplastic. So, at the, with that way, we could expect a high degree of success, the low risk of complications, and a likely surgery-free clinical course. 
safety continues to improve. Every one of you has made his own learning curve and will uh, say, okay, that's true. Um, we have had our learning curve. Um, Re-intervention rate definitely depends on correct pre-selection, the degree of post-interventional residual gradient, and I would say also on the duration of the post-interventional prostaglandin infusion. Prophylactic stenting of the duct can be considered in those who are judged most likely to require early re-intervention. Always very subjective, this judgment, but uh, you can do it from the very beginning. Hybrid approach is also an alternative uh, with a lower complication rate and at the same time avoidance of the cardiopulmonary bypass. And finally, the long-term mortality is extremely low and late complications are really rare. Biventricular circulation can be attained in more than 85%. You can see an RV catch-up growth with slightly limited growth of pulmonary valve and tricuspid valve. And uh, several patients I, I showed you um, can be treated entirely in the, in the CAS lab. You perforate them, you stand the PDA if needed, you coil it if needed, and you could close the interatrial communication as well interventionally. Thank you very much for your attention.